Welcome to RHI Sociable City Interviews, where we meet with global thought leaders on nightlife and the social economy. Today, I want to welcome Sean Townsend, Director, Washington, D.C. Office of Nightlife and Culture. Well, welcome back, Sean. It's been great, but really amazing since we were just in, in Seattle in March. And uh, when we were at the 2020 uh, Sociable City Summit, and I know a lot of people from DC came, there was a lot of enthusiasm for going back with new ideas. You really were, were melding into your position where you brought together your regulatory background, your family background in the nightlife industry, and really defining a new office in DC, you know, with the support of the mayor and, and, and really a, a, you were making great progress building upon all of these different experiences. So now we're confronted with uh, looking at the first six months, the evolution through the spring and the summer, and now entering into the winter. So can you just give kind of a recap of how you feel the last six months have gone? What have been the greatest challenges and what have been the most important accomplishments? So Jim, you're right. Um, you know, going into March, as we, you know, prepare to go to Seattle for the conference, uh, we had just come off a high of good accomplishments in February. We made go go to official music. Uh, we we rallied Metro to get later hours. We released our nightlife study that uh, glorified and highlighted all of these good things about DC. And um, the mayor, uh, Mayor Bowser, had actually uh, had planned to travel to Seattle, and at the last minute had to cancel due to COVID. Um, and in fact, when we landed in Seattle, the first person uh, had succumbed to the virus, uh, literally as we landed in Seattle. Um, and so to your point, things have uh, drastically changed since that trip to Seattle. Upon our return to DC, whether it was the Office of Nightlife or uh, the Health Department or, or the Fire Marshal who was on the trip with us, uh, our offices and our agencies uh, and, and, and government, we've all transformed into really being uh, a, a liaison to the business community uh, and, and really sitting at the table to try to figure out how we can provide meaningful relief to uh, an, an industry that's been severely impacted. So uh, we've definitely shifted from um, moving in a direction of uh, uh, highlighting and, and showing you know, how how fancy and you know showing all the bells and whistles of nightlife in DC to now uh, just trying to make sure that we can sustain uh, some of these legacy businesses that that are here. Uh, so we've done everything from uh, providing small business grants uh, to uh, outdoor winterization. Uh, we've changed policy uh, here. Our city council uh, partners have been very uh, proactive in uh, taking measures to change some of the policies and things that have been um, prohibited in the past that are now allowed. Uh, a, a year ago, you weren't able to take out uh, and deliver alcohol from on-premise establishments. And now it's perfectly fine. And I think our food retailers see that as an opportunity to help keep some, some people employed. So I think um, you know from the mayor on down, we have done a, a, a good job of not only um, you know, providing relief in terms of uh, monetary, in terms of funding, but also thinking about ways that each agency that touches on the hospitality industry could uh, provide relief in other ways in terms of like policy um, or you know, just being, just being uh, engaging with the community to get, get their feedback on how things are going and how we can help. So you mentioned the team that you brought to Seattle, and, and many of them were senior uh, uh, people within the government, and they represented, like you said, fire and transportation and other kinds of uh, key key stakeholder groups. And naturally, our events are always about socializing and, and people going out in ways that they normally wouldn't um, back home. You know, so we went to that historic music venue. We had great food, great drinks, good music. Um, and there was uh, often a bonding experience that occurs. How do you feel that, and then there was a lot of useful information through all the seminars, but, but how do you feel when your team returned, did, did that experience of being in Seattle make it a much more 
focused and refined uh, team or, or were you still dealing with some of the infighting that often occurs in government? Um, I, I, think, I think the trip to Seattle uh, served a, a good way in a few, in a, in a, for a few reasons. One, um, the agencies, the regulatory agencies were able to hear a different perspective from others in the industry around the country. Uh, as they sat in these seminars and they listened and they heard some of the feedback and issues and challenges that other jurisdictions face. Um, so I know coming back to DC, you know, their thought process was how can we, you know, be a better regulatory agency to the industry? But then also, you know, we're, we were having, you know, side discussions at the conference about, you know, what COVID was and how it could impact the industry and, and you know, just watching what was going on around the world. Uh, there was a, there was some anxiety. I can see it on a lot of people's faces at the conference um, because we just didn't know how severe, I think we had an idea based on, you know, what we were seeing on the news uh, and how fast it had traveled from uh, across the water to the US. I think we had some, some idea of what uh, type of impact. We just didn't know that we'd be sitting here uh, going into the new year um, in some places either, either shut down or, or wide open and seeing spikes currently in DC. It's November, we are still in phase two um, with no plan, no immediate plan of moving forward into phase three right now. Uh, so, you know, we just didn't have an idea of what that look, what November would look like back in March. And I think, um, you know, the conversations and the seminars, it was definitely um, good information and good insight it, as it always is for uh, any attendee to hear uh, and take back to their city uh, and, and share with others so that they can proactively try to implement uh, new ways to help the industry. Um, but I think this return flight back to DC was a little different in the respect that um, we had this lingering virus over our head and we also had all of these good nuggets that we had taken from Seattle. Uh, so it, 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 it's just kind of tough. I still have my notes from the conference <laughs> that I intend, I intend on going, going back. back to yeah. 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 yeah, you mentioned your mayor, and uh, obviously uh, uh, we were excited about having her come, and uh, because she certainly seemed to be a champion of your office of nightlife and culture, and really supportive of us coming to D.C. You know, for our next summit. But at the same time of the COVID, you also had all of the racial justice issues, and your your mayor obviously took a very strong position on that as well. And, um, and so this is another kind of component of nightlife because uh, nightlife really is the melting pot in many ways of a community. And, 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 and the way in which uh, many nightlife districts were made safe were because of the presence of police. Um, but under the current circumstances, as nightlife begins to reemerge, there'll be the lingering questions of, of policing, right? And the role of police. And then also how will the racial justice issue play out as it relates to nightlife? So what do you think lessons around this particular area could teach for what could be in the future of the way in which public safety will be implemented and the way in which people will kind of be better at interacting with each other? Very good question. And I, I know that this has been an ongoing conversation in DC uh, pre-COVID. We have a, um, our police department has a, a, a reimbursable detail officer program, RDO program, where our, our alcohol agency actually subsidizes um, the cost of these officers to work at night to be hired at different establishments uh, to help not only reduce crime, um, but to, uh, to, to, to be uh, on standby, ready to respond to any type of emergency situation uh, in the vicinity of the establishment. And um, feedback that, that we had gotten pre-COVID 
uh, was that um, you know the industry would w- was recommending that officers uh, have more nightlife training. Um, just in general to under, have a better understanding of different situations that they might encounter um, and, and, and having the skill set to be able to respond and react to those situations accordingly and not, um, you know, be too extreme. And so we've, this has been an ongoing conversation here. And I think that uh, this, you know, this defund uh, the police uh, messaging um, in my opinion, and I know the mayor has echoed, um, you know, this, this belief is that um, in some regard, defunding the police will impact nightlife um, because a lot of the funding um, that we use to subsidize uh, these officers to be able to work at night would be slashed uh, and businesses cannot afford the hourly rate um, you know, that officers are charging, that the police department charges for, for these officers to, to work part-time. So there is an impact on nightlife when we talk about defunding the police. Um, you know, there's a, a larger conversation of what other funds should be used on uh, as it relates to public safety and law enforcement in DC. Don't wanna get into it, but what I do wanna make sure that I'm very vocal about is uh, we wanna keep people safe at night we do want to have a police presence at night because, you know, history shows us that um, the more that you have law enforcement and public safety officials out at night, uh, the, le- the less crime you have in our nightlife corridors. So I'm not sure where the, the, the conversation is headed, um, but I do know that my, I've been very vocal about ensuring that uh, we continue to provide uh, assistance to our businesses at nighttime by way of uh, keeping that funding in the budget. All right. So you have a mayor who's committed to your office. You obviously have been thrown into the fire with a lot of issues. <laughs> uh, you have great experience that you're bringing to the challenges, and you built a really dynamic team of, of people in government who understand nightlife, its importance, and your economic study shows that eventually this will be the engine that drives the revitalization of the uh, DC area. And so uh, in March, 2022, uh, everybody who's coming to the summit in in person, we're hoping we'll be able to be there in person. Uh, What do you think could be the state of of the social experience? What what do you think uh, with the support of the mayor your inner agency team, you're working with the business community. Um, how do you see the future? What would you say uh, the experience will be? What are the positive uh, outcomes that you think could happen? Very good question. And, and Jim, I, I'd be remiss if I didn't thank our mayor, uh, our council member, Brandon Todd, for creating this office. Um, since the inception, since day one, I've started. Uh, there's been overwhelming support from uh, not only the executive office here, but the agencies as well. Uh, although there have been uh, difficult conversations and challenges that we've had to face with our interagency partners, uh, that was expected. Um, and that was part of the reason why this office was created to have these tough conversations so that uh, government collectively could have a better understanding of what the needs uh, are and were of the nightlife industry. So I think moving forward in terms of what is to come or what could be, uh, what could not, what nightlife can look like in the future, uh, I think it will continue to require the stakeholders that you just mentioned, the bids, uh, the main streets, uh, the executive office, the nightlife stakeholders, um, city council, it will require all of us to come together and, and figure out what type of measures we could continue to move forward and put in place to, um, to help out. So whether that's permanent outdoor dining, I know we've seen it done in New York a couple of months ago. Uh, that's also something that uh, Mayor Bowser is considering here. Um, you know, we have takeout and, to, and delivery of alcohol uh, and maybe, you know, I know larger venues, larger nightclubs and music venues, um, were trending downward pre-COVID. Business owners and entrepreneurs were looking at smaller venues, 
uh, you know, less square footage, uh, less rent. And maybe I, I do feel like there will be a reset on the commercial lease uh, industry where landlords will have to make a decision about whether or not they're going to continue to charge 20 to 30,000 or if they're going to take a, le a less amount in order to get that space, uh, their vacant space filled. So I do think that there's an opportunity for larger um, vacant spaces to be used uh, to provide more space for patrons who are interested in seeing a concert or hanging out at a nightclub. I think the larger venues could potentially make a return uh, just based on the social distancing requirements that we may or may not have at the time. Uh, we don't know what the distribution of the vaccine will look like over the next year or two. So, but we can't wait a year or two for nightlife to return. It's just, it's just impossible. We won't have a nightlife gym. So we got to figure out what that looks like. And I do think that the larger venues will have a place, but like I said, it's going to, it's going to require the industry to really tell us what they feel comfortable with uh, in moving forward. How, what can you afford? Um, what type of policies and measures can city council put in place to, um, I don't want to say force landlords, but, um, you know, bring them to the table to say, hey, uh, these are businesses that uh, without your help won't be around any longer. Mm -hmm. And that's just the reality of the situation. So what you see is a pretty optimistic future that, that, the, that the systems will adjust and that you'll have an opportunity for the creative entrepreneurs to reemerge and take advantage of a changed political, economic, and social environment. I do, Jim. I do. I do think that on the other side of COVID, there is uh, there's a huge opportunity for nightlife to rebound, not just in D.C., but across the country, across the globe, frankly, uh, to, to come back bigger and better than, than ever before. I do, and I, I see new opportunity for uh, equity and more diversity and ownership of businesses at night as well. So, um, you know, I don't think it's all bad. I know we're in, a, we're in a tough place now, but I think coming out of COVID, um, nightlife will be better positioned. You know, we spent, you know, folks spent 7.1 billion uh, in DC annually at mm -hmm. night. What I study said earlier this year, and I think we'll be, you know, even better than that, you know, after after we get out of this this uh, COVID. All right. Well, thank you, Sean. This has been great, uh, very insightful, and uh, you're in a lucky position to have a great mayor and also a great team of people who are committed and and understand the importance and the value of uh, life at night and the whole social economy. So. Uh, I wish you luck and, and thanks for taking the time to catch us up on what's going on. Thanks, Jim. Good to see you.